talk about understanding hardware vulnerabilities. Um, the onus for this talk actually came down to there's a lot of these hardware vulnerabilities coming out. Um, I expect to see more of these. Every time one of these occurs, management goes into a rage because, well, look, this stuff is hard to understand. And in fact, uh, how many folks in here, if you don't mind me asking, how many folks have a college degree? Raise your hand if you have a college degree. Keep your hands up for that degrees in computer science. Exactly, right? And so if you look around here, you'll see the number of hands that are going down here, and that's not a knock at all. I will tell you that consistently, the people that have these information security or MIS degrees hit the ground running immediately after college, and the folks that have CS degrees are like, I'm ready to build a computer chip. And you're like, we don't have a job for you to do that, right? Like learn networking, learn a bunch of other stuff they didn't teach you, and they're like, the people that come out with CS degrees, by and large, right, true uh, computer science degrees, by and large, uh, are at a disadvantage. Um, I'll, I'll tell you in, in one spot that, that they're not at a disadvantage is around these hardware vulnerabilities, because a lot of this stuff is inherently difficult to understand. If you didn't take computer science, you probably didn't take computer architecture, right? A lot of folks are like, no, no, I took architecture. And what they mean is, uh, I learned how an operating system works at a very, you know, uh, uh, very uh, superficial level uh, versus the actual on-chip stuff, right? So wanted to give this talk to kind of walk through some of the, uh, how the hardware vulnerabilities work and give you some management-friendly analogies that you can use. Uh, we actually have a, a test over rendition. It's called the Jake Mom's, Jake's Mom Threshold. My mom is an absolute technical idiot. She can brick a phone from 30 yards just by looking at it. Um, she is exactly the target audience that I want to review executive communications because she is, as it turns out, an executive. Right? Uh, she has an MBA, uh, master's in nursing, has been working in healthcare for decades, and understands nothing about tech. This is ideal, right? Because again, if she understands, it's very likely that whoever our target audience, our executive audience, is going to understand as well. And if she doesn't, eh, it's time we do some additional work here. I want to mention uh, that in getting this going, this wasn't just me. I actually have two of our, uh, two of our analysts at Rendition, uh, Matt Stacks and Haley Springer, uh, that helped generate some of the content for this talk. Um, for those that don't know me, uh, Rendition InfoSec, obviously out there, I work with IONS as well, the Institute for Applied Network Security. I should totally know what that stands for. Anyway, I'm on faculty over there. I'm not a CIS CISSP, but I am a prolific InfoSec Twitter uh, poster. Let's go with poster. And it was formally endorsed by the Shadow Brokers, right? And, uh, oh, ah, darn, how did that fall in there? Anyway, uh, I like pen test, forensics, and CTI, right? And, uh, as far as dislikes go, uh, thought leaders, right? If you have to call yourself a thought leader, you're not. Let's go ahead with that. And blockchain, right? Blockchain has a place, but, but not many, right? So <clears throat> agenda, <laughs> what are we going to talk about here? The overall layout of the talk overall. I want to walk through a couple of remedial hardware concepts, uh, talk about hardware vulnerabilities, as well as some management analogies for those. <sighs> I'm going to step on a landmine here. Even though I'm being recorded, I'm going to make a few bold predictions about the future. Now, I, I generally avoid this because if you came to me even five years ago and said, hey, you'll have a phone with eight cores and eight gigs of RAM in your pocket, I'd have been like, no chance. Five years ago, right, I was lucky to get a quad-core processor and a laptop. There's no way I'm getting eight cores in a phone. Uh, it turns out that, uh, again, in a few short years, my phone has more computing power than my laptop used to. Right? So, so I want to be clear that making predictions about the, about the future is horribly dangerous, but but I'll go ahead and step on the landmine there and give it a shot. Uh, we'll talk about some mitigation strategies and finally close out with a couple of thoughts. Right? So um, I'm, I'm going to mention here that these are not a full list. This is not a full list of hardware vulnerabilities overall. There are way more hardware vulnerabilities out here than this. Um, <clears throat> I want to mention here that we're covering the, the, the big ones, right? as it were, the ones that have gotten the management hype. And the reason that we chose these is that well, we've only got an hour to walk through all this stuff. right? Um, I picked the ones that got the most press in the first place, um, and these aren't necessarily, by the way, the most damaging ones. I want to be clear about that, too. There are a couple that I think are probably a as dangerous, if not more so. Uh, there's one called Foreshadow and Foreshadow Next Gen um, that uh, probably represent a larger danger than some of the stuff up here, with the exception of Meltdown, perhaps, and, and probably Rambleed. Um, but uh, ultimately, when it comes down to it, we pick the stuff that got the most press. Right? It turns out that, uh, well, for good vulnerability today, you need a media team. Right? You've got to create a website, and you've got to have a logo and name the vulnerability. Cause, and by the way, I want to murder the people, absolutely want to murder the people that named a hardware vulnerability netcat. What were you thinking? Right? What were you thinking? Actually, it was brilliant when it comes down to it. I mean, I'm still mad about it, but it was totally brilliant, right? They, they took something that was already in common use, right, and then went ahead and named, and, and partially malicious-ish, right, potentially wanted uh, software there, but meh. Anyway, 
I want to give credit where credit's due as well, right? So uh, I'll list the websites of the source papers for every vulnerability. I want to be clear, uh, based on some feedback that I got from DerbyCon, um, I had an employee of Kaspersky. I may have spoken out about Kaspersky once or twice, so we'll talk bias there, but um, he was very, very critical about some of the uh, stuff that I didn't cite in my talk. I'm going all the way back, and I want to make sure that I don't do that again. Right? I'm not naming names here about who it was. I'm sure you can Google that and find that out there. Uh, look, bottom line, uh, I'm sure somebody's going to find fault anyway with me not citing the person who invented cache memory or did the original research on the security implications or whatever, and this would be one long bibliography if we did that. But in that spirit, I'd like to credit everybody from Ada Lovelace, Charles Babbage, to Grace Hopper, to Bill Freakin' Gates for their help in advancing the field of computer science. Right? Done. Credit where credit is due, right? But not Stallman. He's gross and he's a bad human. And for those that don't know, by the way, Stallman uh, was giving a lecture a while back. And this is my gift to you. I mean, I, we were debating back and forth. My CEO, uh, one of the uh, rules that, that he kind of put in place and he took over, he said, man, I got to have the censor button. He said, I got to have access to delete tweets. I got to have the censor button. And so I went to him and I said, hey, can I, can I show this video? And he says, it's your duty to show this video. And I'm like, game on, brother. There we go, right? Anyway, um, so Stallman was given a lecture. For those that don't know Stallman, just Google Stallman, right? Because he is a, just a dumpster fire of human garbage, right? Look, bottom line, hey, it's great that he did good things for the Free Software Foundation. That does not excuse his behavior towards women. Um, when you make the comment that uh, Epstein's victims were quote unquote willing and consensual, um, I, I think that's, uh, we're just done there. That shouldn't be a controversial statement, period. Um, but in case you're curious how gross and socially weird this guy is, he was given a lecture at MIT. This is filmed at MIT. Um, he's sitting down in a lecture hall very much like this up at the front um, and being videoed and he's wearing his Birkenstocks, which is what he always wears, right? That's, he's well known with his Birkenstocks there. And he's picking his feet and putting, and I don't have time for the full video, but Google it if you have a, uh, have a good stomach there. And he's putting a bunch of skin on the table, but then he forgets where he's at. And anyway, um, so direct from foot to mouth, it's not often that you get a chance to see somebody like Stallman literally put his foot in his mouth, but that's what he did here, right? Anyway, right, so <clears throat> alas. Let's get back to the more serious stuff here. I mean, not that Stallman isn't serious. There could be a whole talk on that. But alas, a uh, problem with hardware vulnerabilities, right? Look, these get a lot of attention when they're released. I understand why. How many folks have adopted a cloud first strategy? Yeah, yeah. Oh, nobody's going to admit that? Yeah, uh huh. Only because you're in an InfoSec room. You go to a CIO kind of thing, CIO uh, kind of conference. Uh, Interop, for instance, right, is a big uh, technology conference out in uh, Vegas every year. Go out there, like, who's adopted a cloud first strategy? If you don't put your hand up, right, somebody's going to come over and beat you, kind of thing, right? But no, so cloud first, right? Everybody's in the cloud, totally in the cloud. And if you're not, you totally are in the cloud, you just don't know it yet. One of my favorite ways to go find people in the cloud is to go to accounts payable and reimbursements. And I love to go find out what people are submitting reimbursements for, because it's rare that employees will swipe their own credit card every day to go to the cloud, right? But they don't do it for free. They always go ahead and submit that for reimbursements, and that's a great way to go find shadow IT, right? Uh, kind of helping you out with a breach, right? Helping you create a breach. Um, anyway, bottom line is you get into the cloud stuff, the hardware vulnerabilities matter a lot there, right? I'm not saying they don't matter other places, but they probably matter more there than any place else, because at the end of the day, the problem we run into in the cloud is that <clears throat> we have multi-tenant, right? So uh, I may be sharing a server with somebody else, a physical server, with somebody else that I do not trust, and I, and I would not trust to run my own stuff here. Um, I'll mention that again, kind of as I started out with, a lot of people in information security today don't have a computer science background. So the concepts underpinning the vulnerabilities themselves are foreign, right? Um, I'll tell you that as these have come out, I've done a lot of work with other, uh, other folks in the field. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about, for instance, like a branch predictor. And they're like, yeah, I, I don't know what a branch predictor is, right? And that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I, I, I don't know everything either. That's why I've got a big phone a friend list. And, and don't ever hesitate to pick up the phone and call when I don't know what's going on, right? That said, uh, even when we try to understand these, uh, we really have trouble explaining the impacts to management. To go back and say, hey, management, this is what's going on. The problem is that Bloomberg, right, and, and in things like Bloomberg, right, pick up these stories and sometimes embellish with chips the size of a grain of rice or, or whatever on a super micro motherboard or you name it, people are still listening to Bloomberg and, and other publications like this. And look, the bottom line is this stuff gets overhyped. That, that's what it comes down to, right? Um, what we need to do is create easy to understand analogies to help educate our management on various hardware vulnerabilities. I've done this for you here, uh, at least for the ones that we know about, or at least the most common ones that we know about, and that's how we're going to spend our time today. 
Um, I'll mention here analogies are useful until they're not. Every analogy breaks down under severe scrutiny, all right? So while I'm positive that you can find fault with these, 100% positive you can find fault with these, um, it doesn't mean that they're not useful. Um, <clears throat> when it comes down to it, while I would prefer that everybody have a perfect understanding of every underlying concept, I know that's not realistic. And when I'm presented with a choice of an imperfect understanding or no clue at all, I'm going to take the former every day of the week, right? So I'll take the, you know, some understanding versus a perfect understanding every day of the week. I'll also mention that uh, the analogies are relatively simple, so it's entirely possible that somebody else has uh, used these before. I've also been speaking on these a lot at SANS and other private venues for the last couple of years. Uh, obviously not with Netcat, that's new as of a couple of months ago. Um, you know, if somebody else says, hey, I heard that analogy somewhere else, it's entirely possible it chained down for me, and if it didn't, great minds think alike, right? Bottom line, uh, again, you know, trying to stay out of that whole uh, Kaspersky crossfire there, right? So let's talk about some remedial hardware, because this is something that we don't get into a lot, right? Talk about remedial hardware. Every process in a modern system has its own virtual memory address space, right? So I'm sure we've heard about this before, where it's like, every process gets its own four gigs of memory, right? Now, of course, in uh, x64, right, we get a full two to the 64 bits, right? No. How many bits are actually wired on a processor today for 64-bit? Anybody know this? Super geek stuff. It's 48 bits, right? And by the way, if you happen to go and, and win Final Jeopardy with that, right, we're splitting the proceeds, right? But 48 bits today are wired, right? We don't even get the full 64 bits. Now, granted, if you look at 2 to the 48, that's 256 terabytes of RAM. So if you run into a problem with that, I want to come work for you, right? You have hardware that I, I do not, right? Um, anyway, bottom line, we need a way to translate these virtual memory addresses to physical memory addresses. The reason we have virtual memory in the first place is it's a sandbox, right? Uh, how many folks have kids? A few? I've got one. My little child unit's running around here someplace um, with a rendition shirt on. But uh, she, uh, <clears throat> back in the day, she's maybe four years old, give or take, taught me a lot about virtual memory going down to the, uh, going down to the playground. And uh, <clears throat> go down to the playground there, and there's a sandbox. She's like, Daddy, can I go play in the sandbox? I'm like, rock on. Let's do it, right? And she starts running over there, and as I look over to the sandbox, I see little Bobby whip it out and literally just starts urinating in the sandbox. And I'm like... I'm doing this running soccer mom kind of save, right? Kind of like grabbing her to get out of the sandbox or not get in in the first place. And uh, <clears throat> yes, that was a very expensive trip to the playground because our next stop was Lowe's where we went and bought some timber and play sand and I built her own sandbox in the backyard. Now, anybody with kids knows that kids are gross, right? I mean, let's just lay it out. Kids are gross. I'm not gonna pretend that horrible stuff didn't happen in that sandbox. I'm not gonna pretend that. But what I, am, what I do know is that somehow as a parent, and I think most people that are parents can kind of you know, resonate with this or at least uh, work with us here, as a parent, I'm more comfortable with her sitting in her own filth or whatever than a gross situation somebody else created. That's effectively what virtual memory is. Every process gets its own sandbox, and, and the process could indeed urinate in its own sandbox and tear a bunch of stuff up in its own sandbox, but it only impacts that process. It's that one process, right? Now, if you start thinking about a multi-tenant server, this is where we get into, and, and this is true whether we're talking about a multi-tenant hypervisor or a multi-tenant server in general. Picture a server where you don't have root, but 30 or 40 different people happen to have shell access to that server or different accounts. It could be just two, right? We want to segment away that memory. We want to make sure that a memory from one process doesn't talk to or corrupt memory from another process, that we can't read across that boundary. That's what those sandboxes end up creating or those virtual memory sandboxes end up creating. And so what ultimately happens here, though, we need to understand that the processor has to convert those virtual memory addresses into the actual physical memory addresses that actually address RAM. Each process in x86 has, again, 4 gigs of RAM or 256 terabytes in the case of x64. And what we ultimately have to do, though, is convert an actual uh, virtual memory address the way that all of our process and all of our programs speak into these, uh, basically into the underlying physical address. And the way that they do this actually is this complex series of lookups, right? Now I have the most easy, easiest one up here. There's really three different sets of lookups. There's old, old school x86, which is the easy one. That's what we've got up here. There's also x86 with something called PAE, physical address extensions. Some of you old gray beards in here, I, I know remember Windows 2000 data center, right? Where it's still all x86, but you get 64 gigs of RAM in an x86 system. How did you do that, right? The answer was math, right? At the end of the day, it was complex math, 
PAE added an extra stage to this lookup, right? So it's three, four, or five stages. Three for old x86, four for PAE, five for x64. I'm only covering the easy one because the hard ones don't really matter. They work give or take the same way, just with extra sauce, right? So basically what happens here effectively is that every process has a pointer in a special register to the physical address where the directory table base, basically the base of this, right, lands, right? So the page directory table, the physical address where this lands. And what happens is we chop up that 32-bit address, right? So for x86, we've got 32 bits. We chop that up into 10, 10, and 12 bits. 2 to the 10th, uh, for those that are bad at math, is 1024. Uh, 2 to the 12th is 4096, or 4K. So what ends up happening here is the first 10 bits in binary of that address are an index into the page directory table. And what happens here then is we use that index into the page directory table, and then we basically go and use that as a pointer into the page table. That points us to a specific page table, and then we take the next 10 bits, and that's the index into the actual page table that holds the pages. And we take those last 12 bits, 2 to the 12th is 4096, each page is 4K, and those last 12 bits tell us where inside the actual uh, page we actually want to go find that raw data. The reason this matters is that several of these attacks allow us to access physical memory. The only thing that ever touches physical memory, because all this back here, this is all physical memory that's used to figure out where to go find these virtual memory pages. It's all an abstraction. If you're a database engineer or took databases in college, you probably remember the idea of a view, right? A view onto a table. This is what I like to think of virtual memory as. It's a view onto physical memory, right? Basically, a view onto physical memory. And again, this is how we ultimately break this up. The only thing that should ever touch this, right, these first two pieces, is the operating system memory manager. That's it. Anything else touches that, we can have catastrophic impacts. And the reason is, is if, for instance, me as a non-privileged process, if I can overwrite this pointer, right, for a given process, for its page tables, I will have read-write access, right, to some other process's memory. And in computer science, we call that bad, right? As a matter of fact, in InfoSec, we just call that really, really bad. And that's a, that's a privilege escalation at the end of the day. If it's only read access, it's a data disclosure, right? So I want to make sure we understand the difference between physical and virtual memory. And again, I'll address which one we're talking about as we talk about different hardware vulnerabilities. Some of these operate in virtual memory. Some of these operate in only physical memory. Another piece I want to mention in here is something called microcode. Right? This is one of these spots where I ask people, and I did a non-scientific survey at SANS uh, back at, uh, what was that, SANS, uh, SANS Vegas a few weeks ago, and uh, walked through and asked people about microcode. I said, hey, do you know what processor microcode is? And almost unilaterally, I think I had out of the 20 some odd people I talked to in the hall, random folk in the hall said, hey, do you have two minutes? Right? Do you have two minutes to talk about processors? And they're like, yes, I'll geek out. Right? And I said, hey, what's processor microcode? Or do you know what processor microcode is first, right? Out of that, maybe 18 to 20 said yes. I said, tell me what processor microcode is. And they're like, well, you know, um, um, um. Let's back up here for a second, right? And let's talk about what processor microcode actually is, because I think it's easy to conceptualize or at least think about it. We want to make sure we understand what it is, because this does become useful as we talk about these hardware vulnerabilities. Back in the day, every instruction on the processor, every assembly instruction, um, actually was hardwired in the silicon. Right? The actual transistors were there for the AND gates and the OR gates and addition. And okay, well, never mind. Whatever it was is the Russians know I'm talking again. <laughs> Done. I kid you not, I actually gave a talk a couple of years ago at the uh, SANS Forensic Summit, um, and uh, it was kind of a pinch hit talk. We had uh, somebody with a uh, death in the family, uh, had to literally like take off. I got notified like four hours earlier, but the DNC hack was going on. I'm like, game on, let's talk about the forensic evidence we have so far. And, and I get up there on stage, and I kid you not, like, I introduce myself, hey, say, hey, we're going to talk about you know, how it clearly is the Russians, right? Because there's a lot around uh, Gucci, uh, what is it, Gucci, Guccifer 2, I, I can never pronounce that dude's name, right? But Guccifer 2 releasing data, and I was like, let's talk about this. And, and literally, as soon as I said, it's obviously Russia, the fire alarm goes off, right? And I'm like, clearly, someone doesn't want you to hear this talk, right? Anyway, this one's probably not the Russians. But alas, uh, when you come down to microcode, we are beyond the point where every instruction can be hardwired into the silicon. What we really have with a lot of the complex instructions, and if you took computer science uh, way, way back in the day, you, remember, you may remember CISC and RISC. Right, RISC being the reduced instruction set computer, and CISC being complex instruction set. Intel's complex instruction set. So is AMD, for that matter. And what that means is that they have very complicated instructions, but at the end of the day, those complicated instructions are really built off of 
the building blocks of these smaller, easier instructions, those are baked into the silicon. The microcode is actually a layer of code that you and I cannot see, all right, that operates independently of, well, uh, everything that we deal with. We just send the instruction to the chip and, and pray that everything works correctly. The microcode's all proprietary to the processor manufacturer. This can become important in a moment when we talk about zombie load. Now, recently used data, separating from the microcode, recently used data is cached in memory on the processor. Now, everybody knows about cache, right? Uh, you know, cache is fast, RAM is slow. Every A-plus hardware technician at Best Buy's Geek Squad can tell you that, right? Why do we care about cache memory? And the answer comes down to what we call a timing attack. Because the stuff loaded in cache is so much faster, and by so much faster, we mean orders of magnitude faster, right? What we end up being able to see then is to query whether or not a particular piece of data is in cache. How many folks are familiar with blind SQL injection? Anybody here? A couple, yeah. So if you're familiar with blind SQL injection, for those that aren't, what we do is we ask lots of questions. We can see the data come back, but we can ask a yes, no question, right? So we can say, is the first letter of this particular field, is it A? No. Is it B? No. Is it C? No. Is it D? Yes. Okay, cool. Next letter. Move on. Same thing here with the cache, except we don't get a yes or no answer. In fact, we don't get any answer at all. What we're doing is loading data, and we're seeing how long it takes. If it's fast, then that means that it's stored in the cache. Right? Now, the reason this is going to matter here is going to come into hyper-threading and some, some other stuff involving the cache here in a minute. Bottom line, because cache data is so much faster, and we are, we are approaching amazing speeds on processors, I don't have time to go into NUMA, non-uniform memory architecture, but if you're interested in like just how fast processors are becoming, NUMA is absolutely fascinating. Um, NUMA effectively, and like I said, I don't have time to go all the way down the rabbit hole here, but um, some of the chip designers notice, and chipset designers for high-end servers, notice that basically for multi-core, multi-socket motherboards, right, that uh, one socket was physically closer to the RAM banks than the others, and the physical distance between Picture this, right? We're so fast now in processing that the physical distance from the processor socket to the RAM bank is impacting the performance of the processor. And so what they do now is they add additional RAM banks closer to each individual socket, and the processors can access all of RAM, but they try to go and access the RAM closest to them for performance enhancements, right? That's how fast we're moving, right? So we talk about fast versus slow. We're talking on the order of uh, pico something division seconds. I, it's not even picoseconds, it's faster than that, but meh, whatever. Anyway, bottom line, if we can measure these timings, then we have effectively what we call a cache timing attack. So the first one I want to talk about is meltdown. And this is honestly probably the biggest concern for me as a, you know, even residually. It's one of the first that we saw that was a big, big deal in, at least in the hype cycle, right? Um, but basically what this allows us to do is read arbitrary kernel memory. Most folks know about ring zero and ring three. Right? Uh, ring 3 is user mode, ring 0 is kernel mode. Right? Uh, by the way, <clears throat> there's actually uh, two bits that get stored, uh, two bits that get stored in uh, basically our descriptors, uh, memory descriptors, and those two bits control that ring 0 versus ring 3. Right? So there's something called a descriptor privilege level, DPL, and a requester privilege level, RPL. Now, importantly, Meltdown does not allow you to read memory from another process. You can only read kernel memory with this, right? So I want to be very clear here, you can't do cross-process attacks, but you can do something far worse, right? You can gain executive privileges in the kernel by data disclosure from the kernel memory, and then at that point, once your system or root, you've got full access to the machine anyway, who cares, right? Then you can go read other processes through any number of techniques. What happens here, effectively, is instructions are executed out of order in the processor. Right? They, they call this uh, batching and pipelining, or the two terms you'll hear used a lot for this. What this means is, I might say, for instance, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I might say, for instance, uh, let's say that I wanted to, uh, and this concept will come in a couple of times here, but let's say that I wanted to uh, maybe go fill a bathtub up here for whatever reason. All right, I might say, hey, Mike, can you go grab me some water? And meanwhile, uh, can you go grab me the tub? All right? And it may be that Mike can't get the water, in which case we don't even need the tub. All right? I'm going to say, oh, don't, don't go get the tub at all. Meanwhile, you're already coming back with the tub. All right? We're executing out of order. We're not waiting for one thing to happen before the next does. All right? And so what's happening here, effectively, is that we're going to attempt to go read from kernel space. This is definitely going to fail. We know it's going to fail. We don't even care about the failure. What we care about is the fact that attempting to read from that space is actually going to load memory into the cache. And what's happening here, effectively, is that the chip designers didn't look and say, well, we loaded the data in the cache. You're not going to use the data. You can't read it directly, f directly from the cache, right? But what happens here is it's populating the processor cache. The exception happens because we can't really read from kernel memory. There's no water. We don't need the tub in this analogy, right? 
And so after the exception, we can still go try to load data for different values. The deal here is the data value in the cache is gonna load much faster. The processor, for lots of reasons, we talked about the sandboxes earlier, this is where sandboxes kind of come back together. If you're thinking, why doesn't the processor just flush the cache, the answer is shared objects and DLLs. All right, so the reason shared objects and DLLs are so much faster, so much better from a memory perspective, is that rather than loading, let's say I've got 100 processes on my machine, on a Windows machine, everyone loads kernel 32. I don't want 100 copies there. What I have is literally one copy of kernel 32 in memory and 100 pointers to it. We don't want to flush the cache there because that data may actually be used by another process, right, on the back end through that three, four, or five stage lookup. So the data in the cache is gonna load much faster, and basically, this is just like a blind SQL injection. We're, we're literally gonna ask again and again and again, hey, is that there, is that there, is that there? Now, importantly, Meltdown can't read memory from other processes. Your unprivileged process <coughs> can read all of your own memories, so this doesn't matter anyway. We can't read memory that isn't mapped. So kernel pages that are unmapped when a user space process is active, uh, <coughs> that, in that case, we're not able to read here. And one of the patches for this is actually something called KPTI, Kernel Page Table Isolation. We knew the fix for this. In fact, the first academic paper on this was published almost a decade ago for KPTI. They were like, hey, you know what would be really cool? If a hardware attack comes out later, you'll just se separate basically your page tables so that while you're in user space, the kernel memory isn't mapped in the first place. Because again, we talk about memory here, we're talking about virtual memory, no physical memory involved at all with Meltdown. And so what happens here for this patch, what's gonna happen here is the kernel pages basically get remapped as we transition into kernel space, then unmapped as we return back to user space. This is obviously great to prevent the reading of all this kernel space data, but you don't have to be Ray Charles to see that there's gonna be a huge performance impact here, right, for unmapping and remapping all those pages every time we have to transition in to make a system call. In fact, some objective measurements put the slowdown here around 30%, right? So, let me ask you this, do you think that Windows and Linux have fully implemented KPTI 100%? No, no, right? I mean, yes, some, not 100%, right? So wanna just throw that out there. I still expect there to be some interesting meltdown-related vulnerabilities with privilege escalation-ish kind of stuff, and we'll see how that all plays out in the future. And these are wicked hard to detect, by the way, from a local standpoint. Is somebody actually exploiting one of these? There's been some academic research on that too, where they're like, hey, number of exceptions, and uh, based on the number of exceptions, we'll be able to tell whether or not somebody's trying to exploit one of these. Uh, there's no way you can run exception counters on, on production machines. That also slows it down dramatically. In that case, the, uh, the fix is worse than the, the cure is worse than the disease. So let's talk about a meltdown analogy, right? Um, if I want to explain this to management, and these are all mom approved, by the way, right? So mom understands these and can brief these back to me. Suppose you send your kid to summer camp, and there are 256 possible activities they may participate in. I do this every year, send my kid to summer camp. There's not that many activities, but I don't typically know what she's gonna do. All right, now the difference here is when she gets home, she tells me what she did, but when your kid gets home, they just refuse to tell you what they were learning. What they were learning, you ask, but they refuse. What you do now, effectively, is you build a test of items they can answer, one per possible activity. Now, the key here is you don't know the answers either, all right? Uh, you don't know what the answers are. You do create the test, but you don't know the answers. All you do is you watch your kid and you see how fast they answer each question. And the one that they answer fastest, that's the one that they actually participated in. That's effectively what we're doing with Meltdown, right? Basically, your kid is the cache that's getting populated, right? Or basically, the data, the activity that they participated in, they're populating data into the cache. And what we're gonna do effectively then is we're gonna make lots of reads and we're gonna monitor the time, tests, right? And we're gonna monitor the time and then we're gonna rinse, lather, repeat. We're gonna do it again and again and again to disclose arbitrary numbers of bytes inside a kernel memory, right? Now some folks have said, oh my gosh, ASLR and X64 is gonna take, because again, picture moving through 256 terabytes of memory, that's ridiculous, right? Um, that would take forever. And initially some of the folks said meltdown is, in fact, I still run into people that are like, Meltdown's no big deal on X64 because there's so much memory and ASLR and I don't understand what I'm saying and that's pretty much what they, they say at the end there because ASLR doesn't randomize all the bits. Address space layout randomization only randomizes a small number of bits. And so if I read and I don't get anything there, I basically get a fault and there's nothing there in the cache that, that I move and I don't move up one byte at a time for goodness sakes because we're only randomizing in most case somewhere between 20 and 28 bits, right? 
Well, duh, in that case, then I'm going to jump by, I'm going to do math, and I'm going to jump by those bits. And I don't have to go through too far uh, to basically leak all of kernel memory. Right? So effectively, this is very fast. Once you find where the kernel memory is at, it's very reliable. Meltdown is the one, the one of these that keeps me up at night. All right? I'll mention there's probably one other one that we need to pay a little bit more attention to than we do, but Meltdown's the one that keeps me up at night. Uh, most systems have not been patched for this. The vast majority of legacy systems have not been patched for this. Right? Um, an attacker who has any local access whatsoever, you can go ahead and say they have, uh, well, if they have local access, that they pretty much can leak all of kernel memory. I hear there's a lot of important stuff there, right? Um, now, you can't write kernel memory with this. Bear in mind, this is a read-only operation, right? It's a read-only operation. Um, but, uh, but still, definitely concerning regardless, right? We separate uh, user space and kernel space memory for good security reasons. Meltdown totally breaks that barrier. Let's talk about Spectre. Spectre, I want to clarify, is not a single vulnerability. It's an entire class of vulnerabilities that rely on something called speculative execution and branch prediction. And we'll talk about what those mean and what those are. But Spectre, very importantly, I want to separate this from Meltdown. Remember, Meltdown allows me to go into kernel memory and read all of kernel memory. Spectre does not allow me to do that. What Spectre does allow me to do is read memory from another process. Right? So rather than me needing to go leak memory, I can now read memory from another process entirely. So <clears throat> what I'm looking for here, effectively, is I'm moving outside of my sandbox. At this point, I'm able to go see. I can't write to another process, but I can see into another process. So let's talk about branch prediction. Right? Any given if-else statement, most folks here have taken at least a little bit of programming. You're familiar with the idea of, a, of an if-else statement, right? Usually, one of those is going to be preferred like 95% of the time. Most of the time when I write if-else statements, the vast majority of the time I'm doing error handling. And I, sh I should not have a lot of errors, right? Errors should be a very, I hope, if my code is, is reasonable, errors should be a pretty infrequent kind of thing. Well, the processor doesn't wait to get, we talked about that pipelining and batching and how uh, uh, instructions get executed out of order. Um, as we start looking at uh, pipelining, we get to this thing, uh, we get this branch, we have to decide which side of the branch to execute. What ends up happening here effectively is that there's a branch predictor, right? So a branch predictor and a branch cache effectively. That branch predictor looks and be effectively becomes trained on which branch, which side of the branch do we normally go? Is it the error handling side or is it the normal side? Now the processor has no idea. It's literally A or B, right? One or zero, effectively. What happens here, though, is we train the branch predictor, basically, to go down a path that loads a piece of data that we're interested in. Now the key here is that we have to have intimate knowledge of the program that we're trying to exploit. Meltdown, again, remember on Meltdown, I need nothing. I literally just can go read kernel memory. That makes it super easy and super dangerous. With Spectre, I need to understand the actual program that we're targeting that's running on the same physical machine right, as me. All right, it's the same physical machine. Bear, bear in mind, with Spectre, you're not just limited to a VM. If you're in a hypervisor environment, you can be leaking data from somebody else's processes. Right? So this does get a little bit, uh, does get a little bit interesting. Um, but alas, <clears throat> uh, I'll mention here that a lot of the times the branch predictor is wrong. In the interim, though, they've gone down that branch, right? Whatever basically they've, they've cached, they've said, yep, we should always zig left, or most often zig left rather than zag right. They've started executing instructions zigging left, and the reality is they should have been zagging right. Meanwhile, these instructions have loaded data into the cache. We now have data in the cache effectively, and what we can do then is we can go begin pulling those out. Now, what's very interesting here is that to save, there's a lot of interesting design decisions that we've found out over the years about the Intel chips. And by the way, I am not knocking the Intel uh, CPU engineers. Uh, you know, those folks are, man, some brilliant, brilliant people, right, when it comes down to it. But they have made a lot of decisions for performance that have heavily impacted security. In particular, the x86 and x64 branch predictors do not rely on the PID or the physical address to train the branch predictor. They only look at the virtual address of that particular branch. This is why we have to have intimate knowledge of the process we're trying to exploit. If I want to leak data from a process, I have to know the virtual address where those branches are at, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to put something at the exact same virtual address, and we're going to train the branch predictor. In fact, train nothing. We're going to corrupt the branch predictor. So what we do here, effectively, is confuse the branch predictor by repeatedly accessing the same virtual addresses as we're going to see in the victim process. What's going to happen here, effectively, is when the victim process gets to the same code page, they're going to take the wrong branch because we trained it to do that. In the same time, they're going to load data into the cache. Bear in mind, again, that whole cache, that's not getting flushed as we move between processes because we're really looking at that whole, uh, basically, the physical backing of memory like we were talking about before with the paging. 
Uh, if you don't understand all that, just press the I believe button and assume that whatever's in the cache is still gonna be in the cache, and that's kind of the point. There was a variant of this called NetSpectre, and this was fascinating work, where originally we thought Spectre was a local-only attack, and I'm gonna tell you I think it still is. NetSpectre, uh, they were able to show that you could leak data over the network using a Spectre-like, they call these gadgets effectively, right? So when you look at a, a branch, basic a branch, an if-else kind of spot, they call it a gadget. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, because there's a variant of it that deals with something called ROP, return-oriented programming. They use gadgets, et cetera. NetSpectre basically goes and looks for a gadget that's accessible over the web, right? So picture you are calling into, uh, let me channel, uh, channel Equifax, right, and we'll talk about struts, right? So let's say you're, you're going over to a website and there's a struts framework on the back end and, and you know where a gadget's at in memory. Uh, if you can trigger that repeatedly by calling an API, you can leak data over the net, right? Now, now I have to tell you that the, uh, the, the data leakage rates are not phenomenal, right? So, so we're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of between eight to 40 bits per hour Bits, not bytes, bits per hour, right? Uh, by the way, on an idle server and with lots of error, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and say not really concerned about NetSpectre. Um, if you have an idle server out there someplace, maybe, I mean, I think it's an academic attack only. Spectre, on the other hand, is not academic, right? Spectre, local Spectre, meaning that I'm on a machine, I'm trying to leak data from another process on the same machine, that is absolutely not academic, right? This, I, I think NetSpectre is academic, right? So. Real quick, where are we at? Meltdown, right? Again, we're able to go leak arbitrary kernel memory. With Spectre, we're not able to leak kernel memory, but we can leak data from another process's memory space. So my Spectre analogy is very similar to the Meltdown analogy, except instead of learning about my child, I wanna know about somebody else's child. Now, if you have children, again, you know children love peer pressure. And if you tell your child to do something and they do, they do it a lot, that other kid that's in their social group is gonna do it too. So what I'm gonna do here, the other child, Right? I want to know about their after camp or their, uh, basically their after camp actions. They're already talking uh, to their parents, right? Now I can't ask them any questions, but what I do is I talk to my child and I'm like, hey, tell me about your activities. Tell me about your activities. Tell me about your activities. And the other child looks and says, mm-hmm, I'll tell you about my activities. And that populates that into the cache. Now, of course, in this particular case, what I'm looking at is I can only observe what my kid is talking about, but I'm able to see what the other child's talking about based on my kid. Now, if that's complicated, that's as, that's as little complicated as, or as least complicated as I can make it. Bottom line here, again, what we're doing is we're leaking data from another process. In this case, I'm using kids, right? Uh, basically, where I tell my kid to do one thing, the other kid does it, and then I observe my own child to understand what the other kid did, right? Uh, and this is all because they're sharing a common cache, right, uh, as it were. So, Rowhammer. Rowhammer was actually before uh, Meltdown and Spectre. Uh, this has been around since 2015. Well, it's been around for a lot longer than that. We've known about it since 2015. Google Project Zero basically discovered that we could uh, basically leak charges between memory cells. All right, so when you look at RAM, RAM is made up of a bunch of memory cells, and we have to refresh those cells periodically or they lose charge. Now we talk about a PTE up here. A PTE is a page table entry, all right? So a page table entry, all right? So Rowhammer, effectively allows us to go modify a charge. Now again, we're talking about RAM. RAM is physical memory. Now if you remember back when we're talking about physical versus virtual memory, most often we talk about a memory address, it's, it's virtual. The only thing that touches physical memory, right, really is, uh, the only thing that touches physical memory is the memory manager on the operating system. And so what we have with Rowhammer effectively is the ability to influence the charge of bits, flip ones to zeros and zeros to ones. And if we can do that in exactly the right place, we can modify page table entries such that we're really writing to another process's memory. Google showed that this was definitely doable. A lot of folks had theorized, by the way, if you go back in academia, you can see that there's lots of errors. In fact, how many folks have servers that have ECC memory? All right? Yeah, all of you, right? If you have servers at all, you have servers with ECC memory, all right? Why, why do we have EC, what does ECC even stand for? It's error correction, all right? Well, look, if there weren't errors, there would be no errors to correct, right? Obviously, we've known this was a problem, is my point, right? By the way, you can actually exploit this on ECC, too, by the way. Uh, when it comes down to it, it's a little bit more complicated, but, but still ECC is vulnerable. Um, what's really interesting about this, though, uh, is that a lot of folks came back and said, ah, it's all academic, and Google said, hey, hold my beer, um, and basically wrote a working exploit where they're able to do privilege escalation. They're basically remapping those page table entries. 
So the analogy that I think about here is social network influence, right? If everyone in your social network shares the same worldview, right? And, and I'm going to go ahead and I, I don't want to stray into politics, right? Don't want to stray into politics. We're not going to have a political discussion. But, but let's say that that's something that's very binary and very divided, kind of like RAM, right? It's a one or a zero, right? You're a, you're a, a, a Democrat or a Republican. I'm leaving the, uh, leaving the third parties out there for a minute because, because, anyway, it doesn't work with the analogy because. But bottom line, if you're bombarded all the time with one worldview, right, uh, you could see where potentially some of us, maybe who are more weak-willed, uh, might adopt that worldview that we're being bombarded with. That's effectively what Rohammer is. Right, what Rohammer is doing is we are surgically inserting people around right, our target to influence their worldview. We're constantly hammering them with the same weird, weird, whatever, arbitrary worldview and ensuring then that they adopt that worldview. That's what Rohammer is in a nutshell. Right? So basically, Rohammer works exactly like this. We're constantly hammering those adjacent memory cells, right, and that influences the charge, resulting in bit flips. Right? Now, if you're thinking, does a bit flip matter, right, the answer is, Yes, 100 percent, right? Um, there's something called a task struct in Linux, right? a task struct uh, basically holds a lot of information. One piece of that is the UID, your user identifier, right? Uh, and what's the UID for root? Zero, right? Zero. And that means turn bits off. And if in the task struct we turn bits off, we make our UID zero. That's bad. Well, it's great if you're a red teamer. It's horrible if you're a defender, right, and trying to defend against this stuff. Because really what we're talking about is you can do this for an unprivileged process. That's really the point, right? This allows me to go privilege escalate. Now, some researchers stepped back and said, you know what? Uh, the whole Rohammer thing was neat, but it's really, really hard to execute. And I, I, it is hard to execute. I can, I can certify that. Uh, they said, hey, wouldn't it be neat if we could just leak data using kind of the same technique? And so they, they took to that task, and it turns out Ramble it is basically the, uh, <clears throat> the instantiation of that. It's the inversion of Rohammer. Data gets leaked from a victim process. So rather than flipping bits in a target process, we basically set up and we're like, I am a sponge. Come fill me up with your data. And that's exactly what happens, right? Now, not quite that easy. Obviously, I'm abstracting a lot of this away, right? But the attacker effectively manipulates memory in their own process, right? Basically sets up what they call activation pages for Rohammer. That, that's where they go hammer lots of, uh, lots of memory. And then they just wait, right? And the idea is to get bit flips from adjacent process memory. Researchers were able to go leak out a 2048-bit RSA key from a running SSH process. Now, when I say an RSA key, I mean an actual RSA key, not those clown Sterling folks, right? Cracking the 256. Mm. Anyway, if you don't know about clown Sterling, mm. anywho. So, uh, Rambleed. Let's talk about the analogy here for Rambleed, right? So, basically, it's tightly related to Rohammer. I'm going to use a social network influence analogy here too. Basically, with Rohammer, we were surrounded by individuals that had all the same worldview. With Rambleed, we're going to assume that instead of us trying to influence them, right, we basically step back and say, I'm a sponge, right? Now, the difference here is that I can't actually watch the presentation myself. So what I do is I get a patsy, right, somebody to go into a presentation, and I say, hey, go in there and just be a sponge, right? Now, I can't ask them afterwards, hey, how'd the presentation go? What'd you learn? What I can do is I can ask them questions about, hey, what does your political influence look like now, all right? And from there, then, I can understand effectively, <clears throat> basically, what the presentation was about just by asking them questions, right? So if you kind of picture that there, we don't see the bit flip directly, but we can ask about the bit flip. And anyway, so basically here, again, the idea is with, remember, with Rohammer, we're changing data in a remote process. Here, we're leaking data from a remote process. Very much like Spectre, by the way. Very much like Spectre. I have good news for you. If you are on legacy servers, how many folks have IT upgrade challenges? Oh, come on, people won't raise hands. Look, if you're on legacy servers, game on, you're probably good, right? This is one of the few spots where most often if you're on legacy stuff, you're probably not good. But because of RAM refresh rates being very low on DDR2, you're probably set. So if you still have old, old DDR2 memory, you're probably good. And if you have the latest and greatest stuff, you're probably not, right? Anyway, uh, so about that. Let's talk about zombie load. This is my favorite, favorite hardware vulnerability, bar none, because we don't really understand it. Right, so zombie load uh, basically exploits, and I say an apparent implementation issue because we're not 100% sure. Um, but we think that it's involving a shared load buffer. So with hyperthreading, everybody hears about hyperthreading, not a lot of folks know what it is. What's happened here effectively is that Intel has increased the number of logical cores by sharing data between physical cores. Right? So what's happening here effectively is that 
the hyperthreading cores aren't full cores by themselves. They share some components under the hood. One of the components is the memory load buffer. All right, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And this is actually the buffer between as you read data into the process or into process or cache from RAM, there's a serial buffer, a pipe, as it were, right, that gets filled up and, and moved. And, and obviously, when something Uh, when it enters and when it leaves, right? And so ultimately with that pipe, <coughs> effectively uh, we're looking for that to be filled. We call that the fill buffer, right? Now the architecture is never intended to leak data between those logical cores on a physical core. Logical cores being that, you know, if you have a hyper-threading machine, it says four physical cores, eight logical cores. That means two logical cores per physical. Now, modern processors only appear to execute instructions in order. They don't do that at all. What they do is they break out the instructions and they say, okay, uh, let's go ahead and reorder these. And if it's not dependent, if the output of instruction A or instruction number one isn't dependent on, uh, sorry, the, out, the uh, beginning of instruction number two isn't dependent on the output of instruction number one, we can execute those in parallel and put the results together on the back end. Processors are really good at decomposing instruction sequences and they operate in parallel, all right? And so what happens here though is that sometimes we execute an instruction that never should have really been executed, right? Because let's say I'm executing 10 instructions in parallel, and instruction number seven generates an not execute instructions eight, nine, and 10. I have to roll those back. I have to do basically a, uh, basically a, a, <clears throat> a rollback instruction. What happens though is that we don't care about the rollback so much. What we care about is the fact that those next instructions, instructions eight, nine, and 10, may have actually loaded data into the cache. This is important for us because this means we can actually then go extract that data. You see a common pattern here with this caching stuff, right? Uh, coming back around again. Uh, basically, we can see that data there in the cache. So zombie load abuses the fact that it appears this load line is, is that cache line. The load line is not flush for those faulted instruction chains. This means that data can be leaked between processes running the same physical core, a guest VM in the host, or multiple VMs running on a hypervisor. My problem here is that unlike Meltdown and Spectre, where I can surgically choose what gets leaked, with zombie load, you got nothing. I can leak data all day long, but it's whatever happens to be in the cache line at the time. All right, so there is a little bit of a, a, little bit of a downside here, right, in that uh, it does get a little bit more difficult to know what I've got, right? But, but let's be clear, there's a lot of interesting data that you can still decompose and take a look at. If you've ever done forensics and you've carved for data before, you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, in this particular case, we don't know what data we're getting, but we're getting something, right? So as far as an analogy goes for zombie load, <clears throat> let's suppose that I have a confidential but very complex project with multiple teams working. A number of these tasks only matter if others are successful, but the teams are load balancing tasks in multiple different projects, right? So if Mike were my uh, my uh, guy over here uh, holding up my 10 minute sign, right? Um, and Mike would uh, basically, I would say, hey, go work on this. And in the meantime, I'm going to have some work on another piece of the project and somebody else. Mike has other projects too. He's going to give away uh, door prizes right at the end of the uh, end of the talk, right? So he's working multiple things in parallel. Suppose that a team fails on a task, right? And another team operating in parallel has already requested resources for a later task. Let's say, for instance, that Mike is only going to give away door prizes if people give lots of applause at the end of the talk. But then nobody gives applause, right? Well, Mike's already fetched those. Let's say that I can't actually see the door prizes, right? Well, even if I can't, I have no idea what's going on with that. Um, anyway, basically what happened there effectively is that we could, a project manager from another project, could see basically the resources that were requested for the other tasks. This is the stuff on the cache load line, as it were. So basically, we're able to go dump data out of that cache load line from other processes. Again, we don't know what it is. We just know that we're dumping data from other processes. Finally, I want to talk about netcat. All right, so netcat is DDIO, direct data input output, and RDMA, remote direct memory access. All this stuff is basically to make your processors crazy fast. All right, so as you get a 10 gig ethernet, you don't want your ethernet card to have to go back consistently, uh, basically go back to the processor. Uh, basically to load memory. So the idea with RDMA, remote direct memory access, is that your network card can directly write into RAM and read from RAM without the processor being involved. This is bad. This is really good from a performance perspective when everything works correctly. From a security standpoint, I'm sure you can see where this is a trade space between you know, security and, and performance, right? Bottom line here, the keystrokes sent over SSH sessions can get leaked remotely via a timing attack if both DDIO and RDMA are enabled, right? 
Um, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on which side of the coin or blue you're on, this attack is most likely to be successful on an idle server. All right, so the reason is that, well, at the end of the day, it's very difficult to pick what we have here, right? We can leak any piece of memory, that, that's not the problem. Um, the, the problem is understanding what's in that memory that we're leaking, right? That, that's really the issue here. And so the reason we talk about keystrokes being sent over SSH is that there's a cadence to human typing that's not the same as basically loading uh, from human typing. It's not the same as other machine-generated output. So my analogy here involves foreign languages, right? I've done a lot of traveling over the years. I've uh, been to a lot of countries where I do not speak the language, and you sit down in the cafeteria, and there's just a bunch of noise behind you, right? Um, how do I know what's important? Or even if I was trying to listen to a given conversation and transcribe that in, in whatever the foreign language was without understanding it, um, it it's, it's hard to listen to, right? What I really need to figure out is which foreign language elements are, are relevant in the first place to collect. Because remember, Netcat could dump lots of different data. The question is, what's the important stuff, right? Because if, if you just tell me I leaked some bits over the network, one, I wouldn't know if those are really the right bits or if it was even good data at all, right? It may be garbage data sitting in the cache. What we're doing here effectively is figuring out conversations, which ones are relevant by analyzing cadence of speech. This is effectively a timing attack, right? Same thing's going on here with Netcat, right? What we're looking at is what's being typed into the SSH terminal versus what's being returned. The stuff getting returned, we can't find that effectively. We could still leak it, we just wouldn't know what it was. Whereas the typing, typing is, is, is pretty, uh, well, pretty standard, right? We all type at a very uh, uh, varied cadence, right? But still slower than machines, right? So I'm gonna make a couple of predictions here about future hardware vulnerabilities, right? Uh, Pandora's box has been opened. And you know this already, right? Because after Meltdown and Spectre, actually, if you wanna back up to Rambleed, Rambleed's really the first big modern hardware vulnerability, right? But with the processors getting to Meltdown and Spectre, um, the door's been open, right? There are some really smart people tackling a lot of these issues. In fact, if you trace the origin of Meltdown, it actually started at Black Hat Europe uh, in a bar, right? Um, and you can trace back to the people who wrote that paper, all kind of conglomerate around Black Hat Europe the year before, um, where uh, I, I'm told over drinks, uh, some folks kind of discuss some, well, I'm kind of thinking about this and thinking, and suddenly there's an epiphany of we should go try that. And they did, and uh, it turns out that uh, awesomeness happened, right? Um, so look, Pandora's box is open. Um, I'll say that modern processors have huge amounts of microcode that's all opaque to researchers, meaning we can't go analyze the microcode directly. Zombie load's a great example of this. We don't know precisely what's happening under the hood with zombie load, we just know that it is happening. The only way they found that is through doing experiments. We're getting better at designing these experiments, right? You can go read research papers. You don't have to reinvent the wheel here. You can literally go read the zombie load research paper and know how to perform other experiments and conduct frameworks around these. And there are researchers all over the place doing this. I expect we're gonna see a lot more of these. I'm gonna say that hyper-threading definitely increases the value of Intel's processors, but there are a lot of details that are proprietary. And a lot of architecture decisions that they made back in the day, and we're talking a long time ago, back in the day, um, <clears throat> I think they valued uh, performance over security. Um, we have a deficit in understanding the black box. Right, there's a huge deficit here. Intel does publish some details about their processors. The microcode level, all proprietary. A lot of the stuff with how hyper-threading works is proprietary as well. There's some implementation details. They tell you as a programmer what they think you need to know, which might not be what you really need to know. I think it's likely that future hardware vulnerabilities are gonna be discovered in two places. I think it's gonna be the shared hardware for hyper-threading. Again, a lot of stuff that we don't know about today, and microcode logic flaws. Again, stuff we don't know about today. How do you deal with this, right? Because I don't want to be all doom and gloom. Most hardware vulnerabilities, luckily, can only be exploited locally. And those that work remotely are extremely unreliable and or slow, right? So, so good news there. Keep people off your servers in the first place. If only it were that easy, right? Now, of course, we have the whole hypervisor issue, too. It's not just a matter of servers or a container, right? At the end of the day, we're talking about the processor, right? So as you back up the actual physical, not a logical, physical processor, that's where we're running into problems here. Now I'll mention here, most local vulnerabilities require significant numbers of executions to exploit, meaning I've gotta come in and I've gotta get exception after exception after exception. If I'm instrumented correctly, we can see this. The problem is instrumenting, it's, it's actually worse for performance than, than allowing that to happen in the first place. But I'll mention here the real threat in the vast majority of cases are multi-tenant environments where the threat can legitimately operate locally, meaning the attacker can get a virtual server, a VM, set up on the physical server where your stuff is loaded as well. Right? Uh, maybe we have a scenario where an attacker or an illicit party has a shell account on one of your servers, right? 
uh, but doesn't have privileged access, right? Uh, again, this is more common than you might think for lots of different reasons. Uh, universities, of course, deal with this a lot. Right? Um, so far, I'll mention that most hardware vulnerabilities have been relatively low impact for most production use cases. There have been lots of uh, possible ideas here. Spectre, for instance, you can get rid of Spectre entirely. It's a speculative execution thing. You can get rid of that entirely by recompiling your code. Good news, just go grab the source code. Download a brand new compiler. Take a 15% performance hit. Done. Right? No, most people can't do that. Right? But there have been lots of mitigations here. Right? Microcode updates, KPTI right, for uh, meltdown. Replacing hardware in extreme circumstances. Intel has not patched a lot of their chips for this, uh, for a lot of these vulnerabilities. Even when there's a uh, basically even when there's a patch available for the for the older stuff, I'll say there's a non-zero chance that there's a critical hardware vulnerability waiting to be discovered that's going to impact computing as we know it. I would say a big takeaway here, and we advise our customers this: consider having a plan for separating workloads onto physical machines, replace server hardware in accelerated fashion. Right. So again, this is a war game. This have a plan for break glass in case of emergency if we have truly critical workloads and then mitigating threats and multi-tenant cloud services. And this includes platform as a service stuff. Right now, up to this point, we've been talking about OS, platform as a service matters as well. Right. So let's close out with a couple of thoughts here. Uh, again, the hardware vulner vulnerabilities exist. They may not matter in some of your architectural contexts. May not matter at all. Um, I'll just say that as you see more of these, uh, I expect it's likely that you're gonna see more of these. Have a plan, spend some time considering up front what conditions actually make for a fire drill. And then I'll mention that uh, the next time one of these breaks, bear in mind, most of these so far have been more bark than bite. All right? So there's a lot, a lot of media that goes around, and, and the reality is it's probably not a big threat. You probably have better stuff to spend your time on. Feel free to use this historically. Right? This presentation will release the slides today. The video is going to go up as well. Um, feel free to use these as an example of, hey, remember the hype around this? There, there was really nothing there. Right? Uh, again, nothing, meh, not a lot, whatever. Anyway. That's all I've got. I'm out of time. Mike, uh, if you want to come up and do some door prizes, outstanding. Thank you.